What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Mentors Collective, where we bring you top mentors from all over the world in all walks of life. Today, we have a very special guest for you. Today, we have Dr. Brian Lima. He is a cardiothoracic surgeon, associate professor of surgery, and a recognized authority on an advanced heart failure. He has authored a book called Heart to Beat, which we're going to talk about in this podcast, as well as he's published nearly 80 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals and presented at numerous national and international medical conferences. He's a surgical director of heart transplantation at North Shore University Hospital, and Dr. Lima also helped launch the first and only heart transplant center program in Long Island. I am absolutely humbled to have you on this show. You are one of the most impressive guests that I've had. There are certain fields of medicine that I consider to be the rock star fields, where everyone on my Instagram that's that's going into medicine is like, I want to be a neurosurgeon, I want to be a heart surgeon, and I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. Today we have one for you. You're going to hear from one directly. Again, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Lima. And everyone who's listening to this podcast, you're going to want to stay for the entire thing. You're in for a treat. Well, thanks for having me. This is great. Uh, I love doing this sort of stuff. I love talking about surgery, heart surgery. I love talking about the heart. So you'll probably have to put a time limit or cut me off because I'll just keep going if you let me. Uh, The fact that I have any of your time today, I'm not putting any time limit on it. You give me as much as you can. You give these people as much. Again, thank you so much for being here. To start things off, I guess, tell me about your journey to becoming a heart surgeon, because I think that's what everyone's going to want to hear. Starting from, you know, an undergraduate as a kid, like, how did you get from there to here? Sure. Well, um, interest in medicine started off, I was young, I was about 10 years old. Uh, My father suffered a heart attack. You know, I'm of Cuban descent and our cuisine is pretty high in fat and fried foods. And he worked crazy hours in a factory and uh, just trying to put food on the table for us and had a, out of the blue, a major heart attack in his early fifties. And that scared the hell out of us. You know, as a 10 year old, I remember, I mean, this was, you know, nothing like that had ever happened to us. So I remember just uh, our family feeling so helpless, you know, I, never been in a hospital before really and it just was very daunting thankfully he did okay he, he ended up getting a balloon angioplasty but it sort of got me thinking as time progressed and I kind of naturally gravitated towards science I went to college with this idea that uh, I wanted to be pre-med uh, I, I liked chemistry I majored in chemistry for lack of a better phrase it sound like the idea of being a doctor sounded cool <laughs> I had no idea as with any pre-med student, the bane of my existence was, where do I get clinical experience? You know, there was no other family member that was a doctor. It was really tough, I remember, to try to do that. So after, you know, searching high and low, I found a a summer pre-med research program at NYU. And I applied, got accepted. So that summer was between my junior and senior college. I got to go to NYU medical school and sort of shadow doctors. And it was on one random, just totally fortuitous occasion that I got to scrub in on a surgery. It was actually a colon resection of all things. But I remember feeling, it's one of those things where I had no idea how I was going to react. I was sort of anxious. I was like, okay, I'm either going to pass out at the first sight of blood or I'm going to like think this is the greatest thing. And it was the latter, thank God. I mean, I just was totally blown away by surgery. I knew that's what I wanted to do. It all sort of made sense now. And from there, it progressed to heart surgery as I rotated through as a medical student and just became completely enamored with watching the heart beating and surgery. And it just was no holds barred. I knew without any question that's what I wanted to do. That's amazing. And there's a lot of people listening to this that think they want to be surgeons. I know I had that thought in my head for a minute. I know your first operating room experience, it's like you said, you're either going to hate it or you're going to love it. And you're the latter. I was actually the first one. I did not enjoy being in the operating room at all, but I respect <laughs> crap out of the people that do right it is really something it, it is sort of like a binomial thing it's zero or one because i have medical students and even general surgery residents you know ask me hey heart surgery pros and cons and to me it's it's either you can't imagine yourself doing anything else or not there's no in between because the years of sacrifice the ups and downs is so extensive that you, you have to be all in to really thrive and to derive satisfaction Uh, You can't talk yourself into it. That's definitely one big take-home message. I'd love to get out there. Yeah, I love that you said that. And you were talking about the years of sacrifice, and I would love to hear more about that. Tell me a little bit about your training after you've already knew that you wanted to be a surgeon, a heart surgeon. From there, medical school, tell me about your path. I was lucky. I went to Duke for medical school, and uh, Duke has a, a very rich history in surgery on a prestige side, but also on the you know intensity side. It was considered one of 
the most intense training programs out there. I, maybe I'm masochistic. I, I like that about it. It was, I mean, because the finished product you knew was competent and second to none. So I threw my name in the hat and I stayed at Duke to do my general surgery residency, which was seven years. It's normally five years, but Duke and similar sort of high tier programs, they embed a couple years of research in there because their idea is you don't want to just make surgeons, you want to make surgical leaders you know, in academia. So years three and four out of the seven were in the lab. So I spent seven years doing general surgery residency and uh, then did a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery, a three-year fellowship. So it was 10 years of training after medical school. It was a lot, a long time. And the, the phrase I always use, uh, sort of what it felt like was, it felt like running a marathon at a sprinter's pace while simultaneously drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> what it felt like. Every day you were just being pushed further and further. You'd be surprised. You're, you have no idea what you're capable of until you're pushed to, to the limits of sleep deprivation and, uh, and skill too. The other thing I tell people that's very, I see it as more of an encouraging thing is like everything else, it boils down to the reps. If you could tie your shoelaces, theoretically, you could become a heart surgeon or any surgeon. There's no magical surgical physical skill set that one must have. It's all about getting the repetitions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as long as you keep that in mind and you just power through and embrace the pain <laughs> and the years, you could do it. Anybody could do it. Yeah, it's actually a good comforting thought. Anyone can do it with enough repetitions. Yeah. So you said 10 years of training. Put a number to that for a lot of the people listening who don't really know, have an idea of what that, what that looks like. How old were you when you finished? I went, you know, straight through uh, so I was 35. So because, you know, you have four years of college, four years of medical school. And then in my case, it was 10 years of postgraduate medical training. So that's 10 plus that's 18 years. I was sort of young and I went to college. I was 17. That was taking no, just going straight through. Oddly enough, not, you know, it's increasingly difficult to find people willing to go through that. <laughs> Other countries don't train heart surgeons that way. You kind of go just like, you know, if you want to be a brain surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, you go right into it out of medical school. So heart surgery now has converted into that. Instead of 10 years now, you could do what's called an I-6, an integrated six program. It's still, I would say, in its early, you know, stages, but it makes sense to me. Bottom line is, we need more heart surgeons. We are on the brink of having a sort of cataclysmic shortage of heart surgeons. Everyone quotes a different year, but by 2020, by 2030, we're going to have a major shortage of heart surgeons because there's not enough people crazy enough like me to want to go through all that. But, you know, programs have changed and I think it's intended to uh, spark more interest, get more people excited or interested in applying and, and getting trained. Yeah, well, hopefully they're able to do something to create more heart surgeons. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are interested in it. In fact, I know there are because yeah. they're asking what it takes to be a heart surgeon. And I'm like, don't ask me that. I, don't, I Let's talk to one first. So hopefully I can sure. just refer them to this video after. But yeah, thank you for giving telling me all of those things. I think that's going to be really helpful. Yeah. Now that you're an attending, now that you're a professor, you know, a surgeon, you're a leader, what is your day-to-day -day life like? Are you operating every day? Are you doing consults? Are you doing research? What is your day-to-day -day life? Like? All the above. This is my now, I guess, eighth year out of training. So um, I'm in a unique position that uh, I came to start a program from scratch, a heart transplant program. So we're still in the, you know, we're only a year and a half, almost two years in. So we're still in very much in the building stages of that. So it's uh, very much one week, I don't see the light of day for four or five days. Another week, it's pretty slow. I'm still, uh, because I'm new in this community here on Long Island, I'm still working on building referrals for regular, quote unquote, regular heart surgery, non-heart transplant or artificial heart pump surgery. Mm -hmm. Every day, uh, you're just, you know, one call away from an emergency from, so it sort of depends on the day. I get up every day about four in the morning. I'm still involved with a lot of research. So I still scour the medical you know, literature for the latest studies and things like that. So I, I definitely continue to try to stay on pace with that. There's always a, you know, a number of patients in the hospital that I've either operated on or being consulted on to determine if they're a candidate for a transplant or a heart pump or just conventional heart surgery. So at any given moment, I have eight to 10 or more patients in the hospital, complicated patients, multiple devices, things like that. And I'm always on call uh, for transplant. So I field every night, I would say invariably between one and three in the morning is when all the donor offers come in and I field all the offers. So I have to decide, okay, if a given donor heart from wherever sounds like it would be a good match for 
you know, who they're calling me about. That's always an interesting thing. And every night is different. The short answer is it depends. <laughs> yeah. What a yeah. crazy job fielding donor hearts at, at 2 a.m. This is being my first time having the chance to talk to a heart surgeon. I was wondering if every heart surgeon also does heart transplants because that sounded like a kind of a, a specialty thing, but is it not? The heart transplant procedure itself surgically speaking, technically speaking, is is uh, in the realm of what heart surgery is, like bypass surgery. It's not difficult. I mean, it's very well within the purview of technically what we do. What does require extra training, and I, which is why sort of I tacked on an extra year, that last year was largely all heart transplant, is the judgment. What is a good donor heart? How do you match the donor with the recipient? How do you manage the transplant afterwards? You know, you're on immunosuppression, all the different things that can go wrong. What's rejection versus primary graft dysfunction? So there's a lot of nuances to how you manage these people. And then you know, heart transplant itself is part of a, a larger piece of how do you manage heart failure? Do you need a short-term device, a long-term device? I would say that in, in addition to heart transplant, my niche is the surgical treatment of advanced heart failure, which encompasses heart transplant, but also mechanical heart pumps, left ventricular assist devices, percutaneous devices like impellas, ECMO. I do a lot of ECMO and all those things intersect, you know, how you can get a patient on ECMO to a transplant or making that determination if they're a candidate, all that back and forth, the physiology, it's a lot of complicated physiology. All that is, I think what I guess distinguishes my practice from that of a more conventional quote unquote heart surgeon that just does uh, just right uh, bypasses and valves. It's still a lot, but it's just it's just a different different nuances, really. Super impressive. I didn't know you did all of those other things too, ECMO, LVADs, all the things that we learn about in theory, <laughs> but have never actually seen. <laughs> yeah. I would love to hear some more about this book that you just published. Right. So the book was never a part of the plan. It sort of just was sprung on me five, six years ago, early on in my practice. Out of the blue, I woke up in the middle of the night with just this flurry of ideas. And I was just kind of writing it all down on paper. And it evolved from that as hundreds of pages of notes that finally I was able to coalesce into a book. And what the book is really is, is part of it is a memoir. Part of it is sort of a motivational self-help type thing. Uh, and there's also a little bit of health guide to it. But basically, it, it talks about the heart, making the analogy that if we were to just act more and hesitate less, you know, you take the heart, the heart just beats. It doesn't think about it. It just does what it does. And so often we kind of pause, we kind of perseverate on things, we let failures or setbacks kind of, you know, put us in a state of inertia. I think if we were more like our hearts, you know, we would have achieve a lot more. And I think so many of us fail to sort of reach our full potential because we kind of put a cap on our abilities before we even really try to push the limits. You know, we kind of set the bar low for ourselves. The motivation for this book was to say, hey, look, if I could do this, you can too. It's not the most earth shattering, you know, um, overcoming adversity story you've ever heard. But there's a lot of, of what I went through as a uh, first generation Cuban American, where we only spoke Spanish at home and lower working class, kind of scratch my claw and clawing all the way to where I am today, I learned a lot about myself, about what's possible if you uh, set your mind to it, if you really just kind of go all in. And I think that's what this book is about. This book is, it's not intended for just surgeons or people interested in a, you know, in a health career. It's really for anybody that hasn't reached their full potential or has no idea what they're capable of. I think this, my life is a testament to what you can accomplish if you put in the work, put in the time and just let everything else fly. And just uh, when you get knocked down, you know, get back up type of thing. Yeah, I love that. And there's, you know, there's a lot of people out there trying to motivate and you really have to look at that person and what they've accomplished and where they came from. And you're a guy, I think I would, uh, I would read that book and I would hear what you have to say. I would take your advice. So I'm glad, <laughs> glad you put those thoughts into paper for people. I think people are really going to enjoy that. And I got to pick up a copy for myself. I haven't done so for yet. Sure. Count on it. Count on it. It's available for pre-order now and it'll be published officially in February, but it's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble for pre-order now. Awesome. Well, get me a copy for sure. Definitely. All right. So you are, in the cutting edge of heart transplant research, heart failure research. Tell me some exciting new things that are happening in this world. Because obviously, like most doctors, I treat heart failure patients every day. It's one of the most common diseases that will for hospitalization. What's happening in this field? So the devices have really come a long way. The left ventricular assist devices, what we use as a mechanical alternative 
adaptive for the heart. The most recent device, the HeartMate 3, for example, for the first time ever in the history of this technology, the outcomes that we've seen are on par with heart transplant, wow. which is really the gold standard. And so these devices are safer than they've ever been, e easy to implant, and are only going to get better. Meaning the next step, which is sort of on the horizon, not too far away, is totally implantable heart pumps. Meaning all of the heart pumps that we have now still require an external battery source. So you have literally a power cord that is exited through the abdominal wall connected to some battery. If you think about these, you know, these pumps generate five liters a minute of flow in perpetuity. There's not a battery that exists on planet Earth that can power a pump like that nonstop. But engineers much smarter than, than I are feverishly coming up with ways to develop these bionic sort of mechanical hearts that are totally implantable. And I think once that's done, which I think is forthcoming, that is going to totally revolutionize the field. Because then all of a sudden you, you, you almost make it like it's a pacemaker or an ICD. There's no tethering, there's no cable. And that in and of itself, even though it's come a long way, some people are reluctant to go down that road because of that, the, you know, having that cord and things like that, even though people can have great lives with that. Uh, it's not limiting all, all that much. So that's definitely one thing that that field, that space is is going to continue to expand and revolutionize the care and impact the many millions of people who have heart failure. And just recently in the Wall Street Journal, the number of people dying from heart failure continues to escalate exponentially. So this is going to be something that impacts you, me, anybody that touches anybody in medicine is going to be impacted by heart failure one way or the other. So this is going to be huge. The other thing that's going to be really interesting to see is the evolving technology of how we preserve donor hearts for transplant. The heart in a box technology, ex vivo heart perfusion, has had a lot of success in the UK and Australia and I think is going to probably have a sizable impact here in the States where it's going to allow us to use donors that we currently don't use, non-brain dead donors for heart transplant. That could theoretically potentially double the number of heart transplants we do in this country. The one field where I think we're going to see the biggest changes, the most promise, the biggest impact for the greatest number of people is going to be in the heart failure space. So, and I'm very excited to be a part of it. And I'm really excited to see how these developments come to play. I'm excited too. And yeah, you're right at the cutting edge of it. So I'm excited for you. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, excitement, I guess, over, you know, social media and shareable articles about people growing hearts with stem cells, artificially printed, 3D printed hearts. Do you think that's all just fluff and the future is these LVADs or are we coming close there or that's just not even something that you, you're involved in? I'm still holding out hope that those technologies are also going to be further developed. I think um, stem cells, I think we, we're still scratching the surface for uh, capability of stem cells, not just in heart, but in all facets of medicine. So these ghost hearts, you know, growing hearts on scaffolds of connective tissue. I think there's been proof that it's, it's feasible. So I think people are still going to work on that. My opinion at this time is that because the heart, uh, as much as I love the heart, it's my favorite organ, it, at the end of the day, it's just a pump. It's the fluid pump. Unlike the liver or the kidneys that do kind of I hate to say more sophisticated stuff, filtering and all the biochemical things that they do. It's harder to make a substitute for that. The heart, you can just make a mechanical pump. And so I think these stem cell technologies, these 3D printing technologies, they're going to have a massive impact without a doubt on these other you know, organs and also on heart as well. It'll be interesting to see how they all interplay. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to see what comes out of these new technologies too. I haven't seen too many LVADs in my practice. Maybe that's just because of the Patient population that I treat, I assume they're pretty expensive. No, it's interesting, uh, not to get on the soapbox, but heart failure is still doesn't get the same street cred that uh, cancer gets, yet it's more deadly than most cancers. Five-year survival with heart failure is 20%. That's worse than breast cancer, colon cancer, yet when someone's diagnosed with heart failure, you don't have, you don't have that same kind of knee-jerk reflex. You know, I mean, if you see someone in your office with cancer or a breast lump or something, there's no questions asked. They're immediately referred to an oncologist. Heart failure is much more, I would say, haphazard. There's, you know, this sort of not too formal way that different docs treat heart failure, a little diuretic, a little bit of this, and we'll see what happens. It's only when really the wheels come off and there's overt signs of danger, right, that they say, mm, maybe we should send you to a specialist. It would be the equivalent of waiting till someone's cancer becomes metastatic and saying, oh, I, I, 
maybe we should send you to a cancer specialist on some level. And again, that's some may say that's a bit over generalization or, you know, that does happen, I think, in my opinion, more, more often than it should. And I think one of the things that's I hope to see across medicine is a shift in the philosophy of how heart failure is treated, that heart failure will start to get the, the street cred that it deserves. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I can kind of agree too. I mean, I don't think heart failure is treated as aggressively, and I don't know if that's an options thing or a philosophy and practice thing, but I can definitely see that. A couple final questions for you. You've became a heart surgeon. You opened up the first heart transplant program at North Shore University Hospital. You're in the cutting edge of research. What's your next big move? What's what's the the big next thing that Dr. Lima does? Well, uh, my 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 work here is far from done. Uh, I think um, one of the major things that attracted me to this position here on Long Island is that forever until you know recently, these eight million people, you know, the people that live on Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, that I have not had an advanced heart failure center to call their own. So I think the, the potential here to impact millions of people, millions of lives, is still far from where, where I think we can be. So there's still a lot of work to be done here. And I'm excited about building, helping build that, grow the program. I think we could be a world-class heart failure center. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that grow. It's kind of like my baby now, you know, I built yeah. the program. So, uh, I really, I really want to see it uh, grow and develop and uh, excited to see uh, what we can accomplish. Yeah, I'll tell you, in terms of big things and doing big things, I don't think it does it gets much bigger than that. So um, I acknowledge you for doing what you've done. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, another question for you. There's a lot of pre-meds and medical students out there who are aspiring heart surgeons. Can you leave them with one final piece of advice uh, going forward? Never give up on your dream. Just work hard, keep your head down, and just take it one day at a time. There are going to be bad days, dark days. Failure is inevitable. And so you can't get scared of failure because that's the only way you get better. And it's a high high stakes you know specialty you know when you fail that means somebody died but if it's really truly your passion go after it with all your heart and everything else will work itself out love that and i'm sure they can find more in your book for people who want to find you connect with you follow what you're doing where can they find you i'm easily searchable if you put brian lima md on google my website is uh, brian lima md.com or if you google my uh, my book heart to beat.com uh, with the number two instead of to uh, hardtobeatbook.com or brianleemd.com. I'm easy to find. And I'll put all of your, your links and stuff in the description and caption of wherever this is posted. Great. So that concludes our interview. Again, thank you so much for coming on. I think this is going to be incredible for people to see. And especially when they come in and they say, I want to be a heart surgeon. I'm a pre-med. Where do I go? Instead of just saying, man, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> I could actually point them to a resource. Sure. Thank you for great. being a resource for everybody. And for me, I think I learned a lot during this as well. well that's great. That's great. Thank you for having me.